Uh, welcome everybody and thank you for coming to our talk. My name is Adam and today my colleague Maciek and I will be talking about a project we're both part of called Comixify. So what do we mean by Comixify? As, as some of the smarter people in the crowd might have guessed, it has something to do with comics. More specifically, we developed a tool to transform videos into comics. Surely one of those grander problems humanity has yet to solve. Um, so to quickly, to quickly get you up to speed, we will start with a sh short application demo, um, which is deployed and you can try it out yourself. Um, you can upload your own video, use YouTube link, or try out one of our samples. You can enjoy the video in while the demo is processing. And here are the results. So we get our comics. And back to the presentation successfully. Okay. So you can you can visit the demo at uh, comixify.ee.pwedupe to try it out yourself on your own videos and experiment with it. Um, okay, so uh, so to reiterate, our application takes videos as input and outputs full-fledged comics at at the end. Um, we split our application into two main parts: keyframe extraction and style transfer. Uh, Maciej will be talking about style transfer and I will be covering keyframe extraction. And it's, it's a part I'm mainly involved with. So, keyframe extraction. So w what is a goal, what is the goal of keyframe extraction in this scenario? Uh, as you all know, I guess, uh, at the beginning video consists of thousands of frames. And, and as you have seen from the demo, at the end we use only 10 of them. So keyframe extraction part, his uh, goal is to go from thousands to only a few. Uh, well, before we show our solutions, uh, we want to to ask ourselves a question: uh, What frames are we looking for for comics? We surely want our frames to be representative, um, so so s they tell a full story, correct story of the video. We also want our frames to be diverse, uh, so so that in, so they cover the full feature space of the video. And it's we also want our frames to be of good quality. Uh, we don't want to have any artifacts, any blurry images, as we need to remember. Then later on in style transfer, all the defects in the images will be amplified. So based on these three principles, we have built our pipeline. So first step is video sampling. So uh, working with uh, each frame of the video is computationally expensive and un unnecessary. We have found that uh, first down sampling, the video was two frames per second. Uh, we don't lose a lot of context and uh, well, Yes, we don't lose a lot of context or action with two frames per second. We still have a lot of frames, uh, so we need to further them down further. And before we proceed to the next step, we do some feature extraction. Uh, we use uh, Google Inet first, first version, pre-trained. Okay, now on to our first model. Uh, next step is summary score. We use a model from video summarization task. Uh, what is video summarization? Video summarization is a task of producing short and concise summaries of videos, uh, which is, sounds pretty similar to what we're trying to do here. We use one of the solutions, one of the best solutions uh, for this task currently. It's a, uh, at the core, it's a bidirectional STM network, uh, and uh, it's a reinforcement learning model. So, as you can see, it takes uh, uh, frame features and produces a score from zero to one for each frame that uh, shows the, the likelihood of this frame in, to be included in the summary. 
that summary is then re um, rewarded with a function. So basic reinforcement learning. I, I want to uh, give you some more intuition about the reward function. Uh, it's one of the main parts of this approach. Um, so in our case, in this case, Arthur used a combination of diversity reward function and represented as the reward function. Uh, so the diversity reward function measures um, the dissimilarity of frames in feature space. So we compare selected frames pairwise and we want them to be as dissimilar as possible. And the representativeness function, um, we formulate the degree of representativeness of a selected summary as, um, as a k medoids problem. So we want our selected frames uh, to be, we want our selected medoid centers to be, we want, okay, we select medoid centers and we want our other frames to be as, uh, error between other frames and our centers to be minimal. So we get our summary score. So it's a score from zero to one. Uh, you can see uh, on this graph, the x-axis is a frame number and y-axis is the score. So we, we can't really use the score by itself. Uh, we can just select the, the frames with the highest score. It will, it will produce a not very good result. That's why we have our next step, uh, temporal segmentation. So we have our scores and um, to, yes, to preserve some diversity, we first segment the video into segments using kernel temporal segmentation algorithm. As you might have inferred from the title, it's based on uh, temporal differences between frames. So after segmenting our video, we calculate an average summary score for each segment. And uh, then we rank our segments. So we sort them from top to bottom. And then we select from each, from top 20 segments in our case, um, one frame with highest summary score. That's how we get our 20 frames. Well, still too much. and. Um, as, we, as in some cases we have found that uh, the results of this step produce blurry and generally not good images. And we wanted to, to battle that with our next step, uh, which is NEMA. NEMA stands for Neural Image Assessment. Um, it's, a, it's a model developed by Google, uh, which basically assesses the quality of images. As you can see on the slide at the top, uh, the input image represents the input to the model and the score underneath is an output. We can clearly see that images with higher scores look, look better. So to talk a little bit about the architecture of this model, they basically took a basic baseline image classifier network and removed the last year layer, replaced and retrained in a uh, in a very smart way, um, the network based on their uh, image qu image quality data set. Yes. So we have our 20 frames we produced initially. We score them with NEMA. And then we select pairwise uh, 10 frames from the 20. So we compare first and second, and select one of them, third and fourth, and select one of them. And with this, we, we have our final 10 frames, which, which later on proceed to style transfer part, about which Maciek will talk in more detail. Okay, so let's go to the second part of our presentation, which is style transfer. Our goal was to have solution that will work in uh, real time. So we wanted to process those 10 frames in about three, one to three seconds. The second goal was to get good quality with sharp distinct edges and uniform and vivid colors. And the third goal was to have no distortions and well content preservation in the final images. So for such example images, we would like to have something like this in a perfect real solution. 
Now a brief, brief introduction to the neural style transfer. The first work about style transfer was introduced two years ago on a CBPR conference. It was created by Leon Gattis and his co-workers. And they mostly focus on artistic style transfer, so the style transfer of some paintings to uh, style of paintings to some images. And it has one disadvantage, main, main disadvantage, which was time processing. So the processing time of this method was about, for a casual image, was about two to three minutes on some modern GPUs. How it worked? They use a classical VGG19 architecture, which is a convolutional network that has five convolutional blocks, and it was the part of VGG that they used. So they didn't use the remaining fully connected layers. And they defined the process of style transfer as optimization process. They defined the cost function as a sum over content and style. The content is just feature maps obtained from the passing the content image and white noise image. And feature maps are, are obtained from some fourth block and it's just missed when error. And the style part is much more interesting because here we have weighted sum over some minor uh, losses and each of the minus minor losses is just a mean squared error between gram matrices obtained from these losses. Gram matrix is a matrix that describes all dependencies between all pair of de vectors and in our case vector is just a vectorized feature map. So after a few epochs of training this, this stuff uh, with stochastic gradient descent and backward propagation. I mean, we propagate those gradients to values of this, of this white noise image pixels. And after a few epochs, we will have results that will look more or less like this. Yes, but it is very slow. Unfortunately, after, after this initial work, there were much more different uh, papers concerning style transfer. One of these were were real-time style transfer. Mm. The architecture here is pretty similar to this that we saw here. I mean the loss network is pretty similar, but they introduced also the second network, which is style transfer network. So here during training, we do not propagate gradients in directly to the white noise image, but we propagate them to the weights of the style transfer network. And after a few, few, few epochs of uh, training, the author says that it's about two days to train such a framework, we will have a style transfer network that will output the image in a style of this one image and with preserved content this of this image. And this solution works in real time. It's about 100 milliseconds for processing of a casual image. <laughs> and it has one disadvantage. I mean, there is only one network for one style. So if we want to have many styles, then we will have we'll have to train a lot of different networks. And also another disadvantage is the fact that here we style is still defined by one image. And we believe that comic style transfer cannot be described only by one image. There were a lot of uh, more improvements in, in this field of style transfer. For example, arbitrary style transfer and universal style transfer. They ha are still very fast and they give you opportunity to use many different styles with one network. Here we have some results of those methods. Mm. How arbitrary style transfer works? It is pretty similar to the real-time style transfer but with two differences. The first difference is the fact that here we have also a style image as an input to the style transfer network. And the second difference is the fact that we have a dyne layer between encoder and decoder in the style transfer network. What is a dyne layer? It is just a layer that matches uh, simple statistics of feature maps obtained from the content image to match statistics of feature maps obtained from the style image. And by matching statistics, I mean only matching the variance of feature maps and matching mean of those feature maps. Universal style transfer is very similar to arbitrary style transfer, but here, instead of a dyne layer, we have a WCT layer, which, sta which stands for whitening and coloring transform. So instead of 
matching simple statistics. We match whole covariance matrices, matrices of feature maps obtained from the content image to match feature maps obtained from the style image. And also we have four levels of stylization. So the output of this, the biggest network, is an input to another one, and so on, and so on. <coughs> we tested all of those approaches and some combinations between of them uh, in terms of how they handle the comic style transfer, but unfortunately we found that all of, this, all of them suffer of a lot of flaws. Uh, and there were some inappropriate color transforms, there were a lot of distortions, and they still only use one style image for stylization. And we would like to have a solution that will take an input as an image and produce the comics without having to, uh, without necessity to give them some stylization image. And that is why we switched to so-called generative adversarial networks. GANS uh, is a framework consisted of two networks, the discriminator and the generator, where the generator is trained to create images that will fool the discriminator, and discriminator is trained to classify whether it, the, an image is from the real distribution on or from the fake distribution produced by generator. And the sh they share the same cost function, which we will be call calling minimax loss function. And the discriminator tries to minimize it, whereas the generator tries to maximize it. And to be more precise, it tries to minimize the negative version of it. But and this year on the CVPR conference, there was a very beautiful paper called Carton Gun, Generative Adversarial Networks for Photo Cartoonization. And authors proposed a solution that was pretty, pretty what we wanted to have in our application how it worked. They define their GAN framework very similar to this basic framework that I described in the previous slide, but with few differences. The first difference is the fact that they use, mm, instead of only minimax loss, they also use the content loss, which is pretty similar to the loss that I showed you in the initial GATIS work. So it's just mean squared error between feature maps obtained from certain layer from GGG, VGG. And the second difference, so and it of course penalized the fact that we want to have semantic content preserved as an is an in an output of generator. And the second thing is the second difference is the fact that here instead of having only two batch of images, the real distributions which are cartoon images, and fake distributions that are generated cartoon images, we have also a third class, which are cartoon images with blurred edges. And why do we need this third batch of images? Edges are a very small part of image, and they, at the same time, are very important for uh, comics and as well for cartoons. So without, without having this, this additional batch, probably our generator will not be able to learn how to synthesize those comics properly and how they were created. It's just, they're just cartoon images with blurred edges using some Gaussian smoothing in the regions of detected edges and edge detecting was created by just using a uh, canny edge detector. Yes, and we implemented our, this cartoon gun. Oh. Uh, they also introduce one more thing. Uh, they pre-train be before actual training of the whole framework. They also pre-trained the generator to output the images the same as an input, and they thought that this will speed up the training significantly. And yes. We trained our own version of this carton gun framework, but unfortunately our results were not satisfactory. And they, we all very often stacking, were stacking some local minimas and results were quite poor. So we introduced a few changes. The first change was to use, instead of using minimax loss, we used the non-saturating loss. And why is that? So 
If we share the same minimax loss for generator and for discriminator, then the, if d discriminator is very sure about distinguishes images from the the real distributions and from the fake distribution, so we are here, it's, very, it's about to zero. Then the cost function for generator and for discriminator is also very close to zero. Then also gradients are very close to zero and generator is not able to learn anything more. And if we introduce no saturating loss, which is the green curve on this chart for generator, then if our discriminator, discriminator will be very sure about distinguishing these images, then our generator will be still able to learn something and it will not stuck in some local minima so easily. And it really worked. Another thing was to pre-train also a discriminator, not only the generator, but for actual training. So we pre-trained it to distinguish images from comic images from content from those blur edges. And another addition was to use the generator discriminator ratio in training. So for discriminator, we update weights on each of those three batches. I mean the comic images with blurred edges, the first batch, the second batch is real comics, the third batch is, are those generated images. And then after we perform three updates on weights of generator instead of using only one. Data, we use different uh, keyframes obtained from cartoons scrapped from the web. We, we only use cartoons with distinct edges and uniform colors, which was, it is what we wanted to achieve in our final solution. And here are our results. So for such images, our result is in the top right corner. And those bottom ones are results from Carton Gun framework uh, shared, by, shared by authors of this paper. Here is another example. As we can see, our solution preserve content, preserves content very well. Edges are very clear and distinct and we also obtained some very uniform and vivid colors. And let's get back to our keyframes. So we stack them in some layout um, and apply comicsification. Actually, we apply comicsification before the stacking the layout, but it, it just like that looks more beautiful in the presentation. And these are results of Cartoon Gun and the comparison. In our version, which is on the left, we have much more sharp images, and which is our advantage. And sometimes we have, sometimes it's too much, too much photorealistic, but we have no distortion, so it, it has pros and cons. And in further works, we'd like to, we would like to uh, focus on two things. The first thing is to use dynamic layout generation. So the size, number, shape, and arrangement of keyframes we would like to have based on, import, on their importance and we would like to also have them in some kind of way visually eye pleasant. And we also would like to um, extract dialogues and, and put them in some speech bubbles in proper frames. So final solution we would like to have to look like this after comicsification and after more or less like this after using these speech bubbles. And this is pretty end of our, our presentation. We would like to also thank our whole, whole, whole members, whole team, whole research team, and also Google for granting us some Google Cloud Platform credits for that enabled us the development and deployment of our project. And we strongly encourage you to visit our page and comicsify your own video. And that's all. Thank you very much. Any questions regarding comics?
comicsification. All right. Are you coming to one question? Yes. What took you the most time to develop? Like out of those, all of those modules, what was the, the most tiring and, and troublesome and, and cumbersome part? Uh, training our own comics gun was very, very time consuming because we, because we tried a lot of different, different combinations of parameters and different architectures and, and to get final, final solution. So it was the, the most difficult part from my side. From my side, um, uh, well, initial research and uh, and probably implementation of, of the models and their combination. How big was the team actually? Four people. Four people. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, and how long have you worked work on that? Mm, once again, can you? How repeat? long have you worked on that? Uh, we've been working about. Five months on it, okay. and the first three months was more or less mostly research, and two months months was the development. Do you plan to extend it somehow? Yes, in those two steps that I described in comics okay. generation and and uh, I mean layout generation and and maybe this picture extraction. Cool. All right, thank you so much for coming here. Uh, I hope you're going to be able to join the after party and have some like different discussions with fellow friends. So uh, applause, please.